Okay, we have about 50 people joined, so let's start. So thank you everyone for joining us for Bay Area Older Adults and Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space Districts Lunch and Learn at Ravenswood Open Space Preserve. My name is Dr. Ann Ferguson, and I'm Executive Director of Bay Area Older Adults, which I'll call BAO for short. BAO is a nonprofit organization that improves the health and well being of 42,000 adults age 50 plus each year. We trek on nature trails, learn about different cultures, explore historic sites, experience new culinary flavors, and help connect you to people with shared interests. Since 2013, we've taken more than 4,500 seniors who have walked more than 13,600 miles in more than 30 parks. Photos from some of our walks are shown here along with our website address. The preserve we are exploring today is Ravenswood Open Space, which is one of the preserves protected by our partner, Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District, which I will call MidPen for short. I would like to introduce Carmen Lau, the Public Affairs Specialist at MidPen will tell you about their agency. Thank you, Carmen. Great, thank you, Anne. Hi, everyone, and welcome again. Thank you all so much for joining this fun virtual event with us. My name is Carmen Lau. I'm a Public Affairs Specialist at Mid-Peninsula Regional Open Space District, or MidPen for short. I'm really glad to be partnering here with Anne from Bay Area Older Adults on this virtual event, and I'd like to share with you a little bit more about MidPen. MidPen's mission is to acquire, protect, restore, and restore the natural environment and provide opportunities for public enjoyment and education. In 2004, MidPen expanded its boundaries into coastal San Mateo County and developed a second mission statement that includes preservation of viable agricultural land use in this region. MidPen's purpose is to create a regional greenbelt of unspoiled public open space lands in order to permanently protect the area's natural resources and provide for public use and enjoyment. Next slide, please. MidPen is a public agency created in 1972 by a grassroots voter initiative. We manage 26 open space preserves in Santa Clara, San Mateo and Santa Cruz counties with nearly 65,000 acres of open space land and over 240 miles of wonderful trails for biking, hiking, dog walking, and equestrian use. MidPen has 25 preserves that are open to the public all year long. This is a map of MidPen's jurisdiction with each of the dark green areas indicating a MidPen preserve. MidPen's boundaries extend from San Carlos to Los Gatos and to the Pacific Ocean, and also from south of Pacifica to the Santa Cruz County line. You can learn more about us and our preserves at openspace.org. And now I'll turn it back to Anne for the presentation. Thank you, Carmen. So let's do a practice question so everyone feels comfortable. As you can see on the slide, the practice question is, how did you hear about this event? The answers are, you saw it on the MidPen or BAO website. You read about it on the MidPen or BAO newsletter. You read about it in a local newspaper, such as the Willow Glen resident. Word of mouth or other. I want you to go to the polling tab and make your choice by clicking on the answer. And when you're finished, don't close the window, just click on the video conference tab to go back to the presentation. And we can all watch as the answers get added to the graph. So we've got 43% of people seeing it on either of the websites. Second in line is the newsletter and then other. Today is an outdoor presentation and exploration of Ravenswood Open Space Preserve. Perched on the western shores of the San Francisco Bay in East Palo Alto, this preserve features raised redwood boardwalks and observation decks for easy viewing of sensitive wetlands and wildlife. 
First, we're going to have a live interactive session where we'll learn about the history of the restored salt marshes in this area, some of the wildlife it attracts, and how to identify the shorebirds one might find here. Next, we'll journey out on the easy access levee trails for an up-close view of the native plants and birds found in the restored tidal marsh wetlands. There'll be plenty of time at the end for Q&A. Before we start, let's have a quick poll. Question for you, have you ever been to Ravenswood Preserve? And the answers are simply yes or no. So just go to the polling tab, click on your choice to have it recorded, and then go back to the video conference tab. All right, whoa. pretty equal. So about half of the people have been to the preserve before and the other half have not. Great. So for those of you who have not been to Ravenswood Open Space before, I want to explain how to get to the preserve. It's easily accessible because it's just off of Highway 101. If you're coming from the north, you're going to take exit 403 and head east on University Avenue. If you're coming from the south, you're going to take the same exit, 403, and make your first left on Donahoe Street, and then an immediate right on University Avenue. In both cases, you take University Avenue, and you're going to make a right on Bay Road, and take it until you see a small parking lot on your left that is marked by the solid red circle shown here. If that lot is full, there's another larger lot at the end of the road by the Cooley Landing Education Center. Not only is the preserve easy to drive to, but it's easily accessible because of its wide, flat, paved trails, bridges, and lookout points. So let's begin with some history about the town of Ravenswood. It has had a checkered past because of its proximity to the bay and because it's home to salt marshes. This image shows you that the area around Cooley Landing in the early 1800s was covered with salt marshes, as indicated by the green areas interspersed with blue waterways. Long before immigrants from Europe came to North America, Ohlone tribal groups lived in the San Francisco Bay Area and hunted in its salt marshes. These Native Americans were the first to harvest salt from the natural salt ponds. They collected salt crystals by solar evaporation from willow sticks placed in the briny water. Ohlone people harvested salt to preserve food and for local trading. When Spanish missionaries came to the Bay Area, they adopted this practice and used the Ohlone to harvest the salt. Commercial salt production began at the end of the gold rush. As shown here, a shipping port was built in the, 19, in, sorry, in the 1850s. By the 1930s, almost half of the South Bay's tidal salt marshes had been converted to salt ponds by Leslie Salt Company, a company that grew to produce almost half a million tons of salt each year. As shown in this photo, the wharf, or Cooley Landing, became a county dump. This slide shows what the wharf looked like in the 1960s after it was cleaned up. In the late 1970s, Leslie Salt Company was purchased by Cargill. Around the same time, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service acquired about 13,000 acres of salt ponds in the South Bay, which became part of the San Francisco Bay National Wildlife Refuge. In 2003, Cargill sold most of their salt ponds, which enabled the start of the South Bay Salt Pond Restoration Project. 
This gave ownership of the Ravenswood salt ponds to the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service to become part of Don Edwards San Francisco National Wildlife Refuge. Transformation of Ravenswood 300-acre salt pond into a tidal marsh was funded by the passing of Measure AA in 2016. The major goal of the project is to restore habitats for threatened and endangered species. Specifically, Ravenswood is home to more than 30 special status, threatened or endangered birds, mammals, and fish, such as the Western Snowy Plover, California Brown Pelican, the California Lee's Tern, California Clapper Rail, the Salt Marsh Harvest Mouse, and Steelhead Trout, some of which are shown here. One of the protected species is shown here. So the question for you is, what is the name of this mammal? The choices are Western Mouse, Pacific Pocket Mouse, Chattawachi Beach Mouse, or Salt Marsh Harvest Mouse. So go to your polling tab, click on your choice to have it recorded, and then go back to the video conference tab. Oh my, everyone's chosen. Oh, most people have chosen salt marsh harvest mouse. Let's see. Most of the responses are the salt marsh harvest mouse. So the people who chose that, you're correct. This photo is of a salt marsh harvest mouse shown eating its favorite food, pickleweed. The salt marsh harvest mouse is a brown mouse about three inches long, not including its tail, and weighs about one nickel. It is one of the smallest mice in the United States. More than 100 years ago, the salt marsh harvest mouse ranged along the central coast of California. It was concentrated, as it still is, in the salt marshes of the San Francisco Bay Area. However, today the mouse's populations are smaller and isolated from each other, largely due to human destruction of and changes to their habitat from development. This includes filling in the bay, such as what was done to create Foster City, levee building for producing salt, farming, dumping of sewage into the marshes, and other human interference. Less than 10% of his original habitat exists, and much of that may be too fragmented or too polluted or populated by imported predators such as feral cats to be used as a home for the mice. This mouse has been on the endangered species list since 1970. The U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service developed a recovery plan for the salt marsh harvest mouse in 1984. Another more recent threat is climate change, which can cause sea level rise that can flood the mouse's habitat. One of the reasons why we protect and restore our salt marshes is to protect and increase the salt marsh harvest mouse population. One of the most plentiful plants in the salt marsh is pickleweed, shown here. Pickleweed is not only the favorite food of the salt marsh harvest mouse, but also the western pygmy blue butterfly, the smallest in North America. Pickleweed belongs to the goosefoot family that includes sugar beets and spinach. It's edible, and its name comes from the fact that its stem looks like a pickle, and it tastes salty like a pickle. You can see pickleweed along the trails and below the bridges in Ravenswood Open Space Preserve. As you can see in the close-up photo with the butterfly, the tip of the plant turns red when it's storing too much salt. Pickleweed is food for birds, butterflies, and mammals. Not only does the salt marsh harvest mouse eat pickleweed, 
but it uses it to hide from predators like hawks, owls, shorebirds, snakes, feral cats, and larger mammals. Salt marsh harvest mice can tolerate high salinity in both their food and water because their kidneys are highly efficient at removing salt from their bloodstream. Since they are nocturnal animals, it's rare that we would see them at Ravenswood Preserve. They are good climbers and swimmers because they are light and have water-resistant fur. These mice have short lives. They only live to about 8 to 12 months. This requires that the population renew itself every year in order to survive. Ravenswood is also an important habitat for shorebirds. So I want to teach you some tips about how to identify shorebirds that are common to the San Francisco Bay Area. There are many ways to identify birds using their size, leg length, foraging behaviors, and more. Today I'll focus on bill length and shape since the common shorebirds are easily distinguished on this basis. There are five common shorebirds whose bill is long, five whose bill is medium length, and two that have a short bill with images showing the relative difference in lengths of bills to the right. Their bills can be straight, curved up, or curved down. The top bird image has a long curved down bill, like a long bill curlew and whimbrel. This helps the bird forage for crabs and shrimp deep in the sand and mud flats at low tide. In contrast, birds such as plovers, who have short, sharp beaks, use them to feed on tiny crustaceans, mollusks, and marine worms at the surface of the sand. So take a look at this shorebird that lives at Ravenswood Preserve. Use this table to narrow down what type of bird it is. The next question we're going to have is, what is the name of the shorebird? The choices are, Short-billed doe-witcher, black-necked stilt, long-billed curlew, and plover. I'll give you some time to make your decision, and when you're ready, go to the polling tab. All right, it looks like everyone chose long bill curlew. And you are correct, the photo is of a long bill curlew. So let's start the walking tour of Ravenswood Open Space Preserve.
Ah, good morning. My name is Michael Hunt, and I'm here with Anne today. We're gonna, we're at Ravenswood. Um, we're going to talk. We're going to try and find um, some beautiful fall, summer fall flowers, and some uh, shorebirds. First, we'll talk about flowers. So there are some flowers. We just looked at some gumweed, and uh, we have um, want to reference a. Uh, particularly useful uh, document that I got from Cal Flower, Cal Flora, and it's a document uh, that's, a, that's called uh, What Grows Here? And if you go to Cal Flora website and go to their What Grows Here uh, web page, and there's a link uh, connection point where you can type in the um, park you're at. For, for, the, for this park, it's Ravenswood Open Space Preserve, and you click uh, enter, it'll then display a list of everything that's been found in this park. Um, annuals, uh, perennials, trees, bushes, uh, all of the plants, and um, it's very, very helpful. This one came up with like uh, 266 annual plants that live in the park, and you can get a big long listing. You can use it on your phone or your tablet to do research. Um, very, very handy. Uh, you can do a similar kind of search function in iNaturalist. Um, the other thing that I brought along just for fun is a, a document I put together a couple of three years ago uh, called Stinky Smelly Plants. And we're in the time of the year now when all the beautiful flowers of the spring are kind of gone and we're into the sticky, smelly, tissely, tarweed kind of plant season. And so I have a booklet here that I use all the time uh, that I created that lists uh, tar weeds and gum weeds and thistles of all kinds. So just some handy references that you might be interested in. Uh, if you're interested in, in the one that I created, uh, Anne can pro provide that to you. Um, and then a Cal Flora site or the iNaturalist site provides some really great information about what grows here. Near the trailhead, we find eight different smelly plants. The first is the jointed charlock, or wild radish. Though it is an invasive plant, its flower is a beautiful shade of purple. California Facilia is a hairy herb that can be foul smelling when touched. The flower is just under a centimeter long and is usually blue, but may be white or varying shades of purple. This western honeybee is keeping busy pollinating the plant. As you can see, it has a curving or coiling cluster of many funnel or bell-shaped flowers. This is where it got its common name, California scorpion weed. Seaside heliotrope can have aromas of cherries, almonds, and even vanilla. The long narrow stalks of flowers uncoil as the bloom progresses. We can see some of the small white flowers have yellow throats and others have turned purple due to age. Pearly Everlasting smells like maple syrup and it is very sticky to the touch. Some other common names for the plant are ladies tobacco and California rabbit tobacco. Each of its cottony stems grows one to three feet tall and are often clumped together creating a bushy appearance. It is a food plant for painted lady butterfly larva. The Native Americans use pearly everlasting as a tobacco substitute. This is fennel and if you take a little bit of it and rub it between your fingers, it smells like licorice. White whorehound is a bushy plant with a woolly stem and wrinkled leaves whose texture resembles broccoli. It has a musky or thyme scent. Its leaves and roots have been used in cough medicines and teas and for flavoring candy since Egyptian times.
California goldenrod is a wildflower with a very pleasant anise scent. It has bright golden flowers with a wand-like stem and alternating leaves. Fresh blossoms were slowly chewed by the Zuni Native Americans to relieve sore throats. Cherokees dried and ground the roots to use as an anti-inflammatory. California marsh gum plant smells like juicy fruit gum. Its unique flower bud has a large amount of sticky white sap that was used by Native Americans as an adhesive. Endangered Ridgeway and Clapper rails and salt marsh harvest mice land on or climb up its stems for refuge from high tides. Check out this pair of Bell Sparrows right off the paved trail. The reason this sparrow is standing on one leg is that it reduces heat loss by tucking one of its legs up in its feathers. Of well, basically, the infestation of spittle bug on these gum plants. Yep. So everywhere where it's white, it's not supposed to be white. Yeah, exactly. Uh, the, the white stuff. The white stuff um, oh, from yeah, the yeah, from like the uh, sap. It looks like saliva. It's from the sap. They create it from the sap of the of the plant, and then once they create that, then they hide inside, and they, you know. Their predators can't get to them. Well, they don't even know they're there, right? No, they don't see them. It's a great hiding place. Yep. Oh, that's amazing. So that's actually plant goo yep. that it's hiding under. On the right side of the trail, we see Pacific asters that provide an important source of pollen for bumblebee queens that need to build their energy reserves before going dormant for the winter. Asters are also host plants for checker spot butterflies for which the plant provides nectar. Here we spot a black Phoebe on its perch. Her sharp eyes look out for food she likes to eat, like flies, bees, and dragonflies. She is flying out to get a quick bite to eat and then back to her perch to wait for more. This impressive 0.6 mile raised boardwalk and bridge across the wetlands was funded by Measure AA funds. The walkway affords views of salt marsh wildlife such as pickleweed, 
that is the habitat and food for the salt marsh harvest mouse and the western pygmy blue butterfly. We can also see barn swallows who are aerial insectivores. They catch and eat insects in the air as they fly. After walking out on the bridge across the wetlands, we see more wildlife by heading northeast on the Bay Trail to the North Observation Platform. Here is a willet looking for food in the mud flats. They are one of the largest common shorebirds and look pretty plain with mottled gray-brown upper parts, a white rump, and lightly streaked and white underparts with a white tail that has a brown tip. Their broad white stripes on black wings are only visible in flight. They are very territorial and will aggressively defend their nesting and feeding territory. We have arrived at the North Observation Platform that has a panoramic view of the bay and the Don Edwards National Wildlife Refuge. The Observation Platform is a perfect place to see shorebird flybys. Today we see willets, black neck stilts, and long-billed curlews. Another great spot to see shorebirds, especially at low tide, is to the south of the wharf. We see American avocets, long-billed doe witchers, least sandpipers, and long-billed curlews.
We even see a snow egret. These American aphocets have long, thin, upturned beaks, rust-colored heads and necks, and black and white striped wings. They wade through the water, sweeping their bill from side to side to find aquatic invertebrae. There are so many least sandpipers on the shore's mudflats. They are the smallest shorebird, weighing only one ounce, and have round brown bodies and straight bills. They also feed on invertebrae, such as crustaceans, mollusks, and marine worms. As their name suggests, long-billed doe-witchers have long, straight bills. They probe the mudflats with an up-and-down motion similar to a needle of a sewing machine. Watch this long-billed curlew as it probes the mud for marine worms with its long, down-curved bill. Before we have Q&A, I wanted to share with you the link to get to Calflora, where you can search by location for the different types of plants. As Mike Hunt said in the beginning of the video, you just enter your, your location name here. It could be an address or it could be a park name. This presentation and other park tours will be available at the BAO's webpage shown here. We also have lectures covering science, health, wildlife, and other topics. We have this really exciting new photo challenge for you. Um, just like to share more information about that. Um, it is a Ravenswood Bay Trail photo challenge, and it's offered at Ravenswood Open Space Preserve. The challenge is quite simple. Just when you're visiting Ravenswood Preserve, go ahead and snap a photo or selfie while you're there and post on our social media and submit the photo to us online. Um, and once you submit to us, you'll receive a free starter pack of collectible mid-pen postcards. They're really colorful and nice. Um, I think they look great, uh, these postcards, and they're just a really great additional incentive for you to go visit this preserve. So we hope you uh, can join our challenge, and we hope to see you on the trails at Ravenswood Preserve. Um, and that really concludes our presentation today. Thank you so much for joining. We really appreciate the time um, that you took to join us virtually, and we really hope that you learned something new today. Um, 
Learn more about Bay Area older adults and sign up for their newsletter on their webpage at, at bayareaolderadults.org. And to find out more about MinPed, visit our webpage at openspace.org. Um, you can also get our maps, directions, and preserve information for Ravenswood by visiting openspace.org forward slash Ravenswood. And you can still stay connected with us on social media by following MidPen Open Space.